All righty. Let us look really quickly again at center of mass and then get into rotation. So the big takeaways with center of mass there were essentially two expressions we wrote down. We wrote down that the velocity, the center of mass velocity, was the sum of all the individual momentums, m times v, of all the particles making up the system, divided by the total mass of the system, the sum of all the mass in the system. And we call that the center of mass velocity. Similarly, for the center of mass position, we could do the same, but we're adding up all the mass times the positions of all the individual little objects that make up an extended object. And we argued um, using momentum, as we did before, that in this case, when we do this, we can treat the net external force acting on the system as being equal to the total mass of the system times the acceleration of the center of mass of the entire system. This is saying that when there are external forces outside the interactions that are going on inside the system, that those external forces move the system as a whole. So in the past, in case this wasn't clear, in the past when I said I have this apple of 0.1 kilograms and I drop it and it falls you know, and it accelerates downward at a meter at 9.8 meters per second squared. What I really was saying is I have this, this extended system that is the apple, which is made up of, you know, billions and billions of individual molecules and atoms. When I let go of the system, there is an external force on the system, namely gravity that is pulling down on everything inside the system. As a result, the entire system starts to accelerate towards the ground uh, with an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. That acceleration is the acceleration of the system. This entire apple then, uh, since in this case, since everything remains a solid, nothing is moving inside the system relative to one another, the shape of the apple is not changing. As a result, when I say the center of mass velocity, that is what we have been using when I have been doing these demos, you know, for the last couple weeks. You know, when I look at a ball that's swinging in a circle, and there is an extended object here that is made up of many, many, you know, pieces of mass. But when I say that the entire thing is moving, you know, with some acceleration, some velocity, what I'm saying is that the entire system as a whole has some overall velocity, which is the center of mass velocity. And I can get the correct answer, the exact correct answer of what the system as a whole is doing if I assume that the, if I take everything that makes up the system, replace it with a single particle located at the center of mass position. That particle that represents the system is moving with a velocity equal to the center of mass velocity. So, right, and we see this, actually, before we get to those, we see this, um, you know, for example, you know, a couple of examples that might come to mind is, you know, let's take the bottom one first, so fireworks. If someone launches a firework into the sky, and then while it's coming, you know, if it remains just one rocket, it will follow a uh, trajectory. It will be a parabola. But then suppose at some point the firework goes off and explodes. Now turning that one, now turning the system, which was originally comprised of many pieces all inside the rocket, now all those pieces are moving in possibly different directions. Nonetheless, since that all happened, in, happened internal to the system, I could still calculate all the positions and all the velocities of all the individual elements of that firework, and I would find the center of mass of that entire firework system was exactly the same and continues to follow that same parabolic trajectory, even though there are, there are pieces of the firework that is moving in different directions. But as a whole, they all continue to move along that center of mass path. As if 
the entire firework remained replaced with just a single point particle that represented the object. You know, in dancing and ballet, particularly, you know, the grand jet, uh, where a, where a dancer leaps into the sky, also lifts their legs high into the sky, and gives this appearance that they are flying. Um, they appear to just hover above the ground for an incredibly long amount of time. And what they're doing is that they're moving um, in a way uh, that up gives the impression, gives the illusion that they are are flying, but really. What they're doing is they're shifting their center of mass. You know, once they leave, once they jump into the air, their center of mass will follow a parabolic path, you know, like a parabola. You know, it will be a parabola like the usual trajectories um, that we just did in chapters uh, four. The grand jet technique, you know, they lift their legs into the air, which then shifts their mass upward. So their center of mass might start kind of in their stomach, but when they lift their legs into the air, that has that's repositioning their mass. So their center of mass appears to go goes higher up into their chest. The location, the balancing point. If we were to uh, try to balance them on my finger, that path remains always. Right, the same para parabolic trajectory. Um, but by lifting the legs into the air, they give the appearance that while they are in the air, um, they remain far away from the ground for longer periods of time. Really, it's that they're just bringing their body, you know, up. You know, they're relatively move shifting their weight uh, or their mass, really is the more appropriate word, you know, up so that their center of mass rises up a little bit. And so while that center of mass follows the trajectory, they appear to hover in the sky. And then they bring their legs back down at the end. You know, similarly for this, uh, for someone who is, you know, doing a belly flop into the water. You know, when they run, they have some center of mass, which they may, which is located on their body as they fall, even though, and they might be flailing and doing other things and, you know, sh you know waving their arms and legs and, and doing whatever. But nonetheless, their center of mass still follows the same parabolic path uh, like what we studied in chapter four, even though there can be relative internal motions inside the system. All right, so these were just, I guess, a couple quick intuition checks. Right. I have a bottle of wine that's half full. I set it on its side. If you had to make an estimation for where the center of mass is, where would you put it? Now, in this case, it's a little tricky because there's, you know, whenever you can use symmetry, that's awesome. Um, but right now, it looks like, you know, if it was just an empty bottle, I might put it somewhere right in the vertical middle of the bottle. And then it, I would have to think whether it shifted to the left or to the right. So an empty bottle, I might put at that line dividing where there's wine and where there's no wine. Since the wine has mass much more than the air above it, uh, that shifts the center of mass down a little bit. So the center of mass is somewhere in the lower half of the wine bottle. And since glass, the, which is particularly heavy, um, there's more glass on the left side than the right side. You know, if I were to divide this in half, I might this would kind of break into four sections. Since the top is empty compared to the bottom, the center of mass shifts down. And since the neck of the bottle and contains less glass than the base of the bottle, right? I might guess that the center mass is somewhere like right here. In the case of a one-sided baton, a rod with a uniform mass uh, that has one ball at the end, where might you put the center of mass? In this case, we can actually calculate it exactly. Because the nice thing about center of mass is, is that you can find the overall center of mass by finding the center of masses of the center of masses. So what do I mean by that? The center of mass of the rod, we did this problem last time, uh, is located at, you know, x center of mass is located at L over 2 for just the rod. And then the center of mass of the ball is located at x center of mass equals to zero. 
and to find the location of the center of mass for the rod and the ball, I can do m ball plus x center of mass ball plus x rod times x center of mass rod all divided by m ball plus m rod. In that case, given what I said, it seems like I'm saying the ball is three times as massive as the rod, so the denominator is 4m. The numerator, the center of mass of the ball was zero, so then it's m rod, which is just m, times the center of mass of the rod, which was l over two. The m's cancel. Uh, and it looks like in this case, it is l over eight. Again, it's closer to zero. L over eight is closer to zero than L over two. The center of mass has shifted towards where all the mass is, which in this case, a lot of the mass is in the ball at the end. Uh, so the center of mass in this case is located closer to the ball. All right, that's it for uh, translational motion. Up until now, we rarely have been focusing, except for a couple you know, instances. We did think about circular motion at some point, where we were thinking that if there's an object, and we'll see this later, so I'll just recap it now. If we see an object that's moving in a circle at some velocity, we argued that there must be some, some centripetal force that is pulling the object towards the center of the circle. And if the force and the velocity remain perpendicular to one another, that results in uniform circular motion. And the acceleration, when you are undergoing centripetal acceleration, remember it was V squared over R, big R, where big R is the effective radius of the circle, right? If it's an actual circle, it's just the radius of the circle. That really was the only instance where we saw circular motion. Everything else was talking about uh, objects, you know, moving in translation, you know, moving up and down, moving left and right, maybe moving at an arc relative, to, you know, relative to the ground. Uh, we were always focused on translational motion, how you got from point A to point B. Um, this section of the course, sorry, I'm looking for my wheel, which I've lost. Um, this section of the course is focusing instead on things like rotational motion. So in this case, right, I would say the ball is not necessarily going anywhere. It's still staying in the relatively same place in my office, though it is rotating around my hand. It is rotating around a point, you know, where my hand is in contact with the string. So there is nonetheless motion, Right? I might say that there is a kinetic, you know, I can't, well, I must say that there is a kinetic energy associated with this ball as it moves in a circle, even though it's not necessarily flying or going anywhere. And there is nonetheless energy associated with this motion. You know, I can feel that motion. You know, I can feel that momentum as well. You might think that there's some momentum associated with rotation, which I definitely feel when the ball hits me. You know, I feel that impulse. And when the ball comes in contact with me, I cannot claim that even though the object doesn't seem to be relatively moving around, it seems somewhat fixed in place. There is still energy, there's still momentum associated with it. And that is all, of course, the result of forces. Uh, so this next section is, is to think about what does, how do we quantify, how do we explain motion that occurs about some rotational axis? So in the case of me spinning this ball, everything appears to be rotating about my hand. And that seems to be the center point that all this, all this rotation is occurring around. We call that the rotational axis. That is the point of, or the axis of rotation. That is the location that is, the object is rotating around. You can think of it as the origin of our coordinate system, but for rotational motion. You know, for example, you know, if I had like a baseball bat that I toss into the air, I don't have a baseball bat, but I have, you know, like a little stick, I could toss it into the air, um, there's some rotation that I give it as a result, um, 
based on what on the previous lecture, we now know that the actual translational motion, the motion as it comes up and comes back down, can be explained if I just took all the mass, replaced it as a particle located at the center of mass of this rod, and then that rod would come up and then accelerate down, and the acceleration would be 9.8 meters per second squared. And that would be exactly the, I would get exactly the same answer if I instead threw it up into the air but gave it a little rotation as well. It would still come up to the same height, um, come back down, and the overall acceleration would still be about 9.8 meters per second squared. In the case of when there is rotation, on top of that translational motion is also the fact that the, that the baton or the baseball bat is spinning around. Um, it is spinning around some axis of rotation, some point that it seems to pivot around. So if we, you know, for the for a, um, a baseball bat, right? If we gave it a spin about, or say, the handle, maybe I tried to spin spin it about the handle. Then in this case, the top would kind of rotate this way, the bottom would rotate this way. We would call this the axis of rotation. Individual particles that make up the rod or the baseball bat do not seem to be getting any closer or farther away to the axis of rotation, but it's rotating about the axis of rotation. You know, it's kind of rotating about a certain point that it's not, you know, it's not heading towards, it's not heading away from, uh, it's rotating around some point, some axis of rotation. So we could even define that as a, right, a rotation axis. Right, and that might be a point or a line. The object rotates around. You know, say if it was a merry-go-round. The merry-go-round does rotate in a circle around the center of the merry-go-round. If we were to draw a vertical line that goes from the ground, you know, vertically upward at the very center of the merry-go-round, we would call that line the axis of rotation. The, ro the merry-go-round goes around um, uh, in a circle around that line. Um, and why there? Why not the edge of the merry-go-round? You know, again, let's look at the, a, an, a bird's eye view of this. If this were the merry-go-round and I'm saying, and I'm looking down bird's eye, top down, and this were my axis of rotation, right? That means that all the motion of the merry-go-round goes about that axis. In this case, the location of the individual horses and whatnot that make up the merry-go-round do not get any closer or farther away from that axis. Versus if I claimed, okay, here's the same merry-go-round, but then here is my axis of rotation. What that would say is that it wouldn't be the case where the merry-go-round was just rotating in place, but that would mean that eventually the entire merry-go-round would be over here, eventually the entire merry-go-round would be over here. You know, in that case, the merry-go-round would kind of move as a whole you know, around the, around the axis. You know, the, another example could be, you know, I take my, I take this book, I could rotate it about this point where I can just kind of spin it in place. Individual, individual parts of the book are not getting closer or farther away from the axis. Versus if I had my axis of rotation right here, this would be as if the entire book were doing this, it's rotating around this axis which looks quite different than if I rotate it like this. So for the rotation axis, we can say relative positions to this axis do not change. I have to add a little caveat of, say, for rigid objects. 
we're going to consider bicycle wheels, merry-go-rounds, you know, things where the shapes of them are not changing. Um, you can have, for example, you can, you can talk about the Earth rotating around the sun, and it does so roughly in a circle. But you could also talk about Pluto rotating around the sun, where its path that it takes is not a perfect circle. The Earth's is not either, but it's more obvious with Pluto, uh, where you can see that there are some times when Pluto's closer to the sun, or you, you know, the point where it's rotating around, some parts where it's farther away. That's a little bit more complicated. Let's just focus in on rigid objects, uh, wheel, you know, things that are not changing shape, you know, CDs that spin, windmills, uh, merry-go-rounds, that sort of thing. All right, so speaking of bicycle wheels, we could, you know, to motivate this, the idea is that suppose I have a bicycle wheel and there's various spokes. And to bedazzle my bike, I put, you know, a red bead right here and then I put a blue bead right here. And then as I move the wheel forward, the wheel moves to some, lo some new location. But the wheel has also rotated as a result. Rotating about, I could ask, where's the rotation axis? Rotating about the very center of the wheel. The wheel rotates around that center point. And in this case, I might find that, you know, at some later time, the red, the red uh, bead has moved over to here. And as a result, the blue bead has moved over to here. Uh, so if I copy and paste this and put it underneath, so that we can compare. In this case, it looks like the blue bead has rotated, you know, it started here. So it rotated in some way to this point, uh, where the red bead uh, started here and rotated to this point. Rotation is easily explained in terms of angles. So now the question is, how can we quantify um, what this motion looks like? The good news is, essentially everything we're about to do is just going to be a redo of what we've done the last couple weeks. Except instead of positions, we might, we're going to say angular positions. Instead of velocity, we're going to say angular velocity. And most of the formulas have an analogy in rotational motion. The bad news is, is that rotation is a little bit harder to visualize, uh, so we have to be careful uh, with, what we, with what we do. So let's first start talking about position. And instead of position, I'm going to talk about instead angular position. And I'm going to call it the measure of angle from some zero point, really zero line. So just like how in regular position we had an origin and then if we had an origin we could specify where the thing was located and we were specifying it relative to an origin. You know, three meters means it's three meters you know, in the positive direction from the origin. Negative two meters means it was in the negative direction um, two meters. For angles we do the same thing. Um, so I could have say uh, some some line out here um, and there could be some particle that starts here and then rotates out to end up at this location similarly you know if there was another bead on this rod it would have also rotated out to be at this location and if there was a third bead that started here and that rod rotated it would rotate out to then be at this location each of these beads changed its location by some angle, right? There's some delta theta, I will call it. Um, the rod rotated by some angle um, that we measure from some zero point, which is usually just the positive x-axis, you know, like, like you've seen in all your math classes. 
you know, there's some angle that's sub subtended uh, when the particles moved. Um, so we could say that is the angle right, some, the angle the object moves between two points. And we define that using the variable uh, theta. The units of theta, and here I have to be insistent, are radians, not degrees. If you're going to do physics calculations uh, that don't involve you plugging something into sine or cosine, you have to be careful. Your angle must be in radians as an example. Suppose you have some rod that rotated through some angle and there was some bead here you know that rotated to some angle and started here. You know a question I could ask is what is this length s given that the rod had some radius r? So what you're asking is that the rod has gone through some arc. It has sweeped out a little bit of arc, not a full circle, but it has sweeped out a bit of an arc. You know, maybe it's swept out 30 degrees or 45 degrees, 28 degrees. Uh, and I could ask, what is the length of, of distance that uh, this, this um, bead moved across? This is defined um, as S over R. This actually is the way maybe a geometry class would define the angle in this case. The angle is defined as that arc that's being swept out divided by the radius of the, of the uh, rod. In which case then I would say S, the length of that arc is theta times R. It's not worth a big highlight, we'll put a minor highlight. In this case, this is clear why you have to use radians instead of degrees. If I plug in 18 degrees times R, um, that does not have any physical meaning. For example, if you think about this, you know, this is what it swept out when it swept out, um, you know, some angle theta. If it swept out 90 degrees, I would say it's pi over two times the radius. If it swept out 180 degrees, I would say it's pi times the radius. We also know from geometry that if it sweeps out a full circle, 360 degrees, then that arc that it swept out is one full circle, one full circumference. And notice you don't get that unless you plug in theta in terms of radians. You know, S equals 360 degrees times R is incorrect. Instead you say, in the case where it goes out a full circle, 360 degrees is the same thing as two pi radians um, times r. And again, so then you just get the circumference of the circle is two pi r, you know, as you would expect. So in case you're a little rusty, remember that the conversion factor is 180 degrees equals pi radians or that a full circle 360 degrees is defined as two pi radians. The degrees were, were, were invented as a more refined way of measuring uh, angles where the radians have physical uh, origins and meaning. So if I said that something went through an angular displacement of pi over two radians, I would I could envision that that object went through a displacement of 90 degrees. In that case, that allows me actually to define angular displacement. Delta theta.
which we define as theta two minus theta one. Analogous to how we defined regular displacement where we said delta x is x two minus x one. You know, again, here's my example. If I have some bead here and it rotates through some angle, it might end up here where this is some delta theta. Then if I have this bead, it rotates all the way out here. It rotates through the same delta theta. And that's why you have to be careful not to confuse. In both these cases, the red, bleed, the red bead and the blue bead, they both have the same angular displacement. They both move through the same angle, though their distances that they traveled are different. In the case of the red, the red bead, it traveled through a distance, you know, if this length here is little r, it traveled through a distance delta theta times r. Where for the blue bead, if this distance is big R, the blue bead went through the same angular displacement times big R. Where big R is greater than little r. In that case, uh, they move greater distances. They had a larger actual displacement, but the same angular displacement. about some rotation axis that must be specified. Push forth. If this occurs, if this occurs in delta t, perhaps the wheel rotates 90 degrees in half a second. What can I say about the rate at which my angle is changing, the rate at which the wheel is spinning. Before we defined an average velocity to talk about how an object was moving, now we can define an average angular velocity. which we use the case, we use lowercase um, omega. So it looks a lot like a W. So omega average we can define as delta theta over delta t. How is the rate at which the angles are changing with time? That is uh, a measure of the angular velocity. This then allows us to, as the limit of delta t goes to zero, we get the instantaneous velocity. Uh, I should have made this blue. All right, this gives us an average velocity, angular velocity. Then I would say we get an instantaneous, or I'll just say an angular velocity, you know, omega, which we can define as the limit as delta t goes to zero of the uh, average angular velocity. And then similarly, that is just defined as the derivative of theta with respect to time. How is theta changing at an, any instantaneous moment? That is the uh, angular velocity. So, so far we've seen that x can be replaced by theta, and that all seems, you know, that was all defined kind of the same way. Velocity, uh, the analogous connection is omega. So in terms of another example to think about this with omega, you know, what is speeding up and slowing down look like with omega? You know, so again, we have to think of this in terms of angles, not the actual uh, 
true velocities of the object. So if something was rotating at a constant rate, I might say, you know, I'm, it might look something like this, where every, say, every half a second, um, it moves through the same amount of, you know, some, some delta theta, some delta theta. If omega is constant, that's it moves through the same delta theta every second or every whatever. So example on omega, that's equal to pi over two radians per second means that every second the wheel or the mirror or the whatever whatever is rotating rotates by 90 degrees now in this case we now can talk about is omega a vector you know when i say omega is pi over 2 radians per second Really, that's an assumption. I'm saying something about the direction the thing is rotating as well. You know, by convention, rotation is taken to be counterclockwise around your around your origin. You know, thinking of it from a math class. But what if, for example, I had you know perhaps my motion was kind of you know, not necessarily flat with the page. But it was some motion that was, you know, suppose it looked like this. You know, it was in some circle that was at an angle relative to how I'm looking at it. You know, that is different than if I were to draw the same thing, but then draw the arrows in the other way. You know, this is different than this. Uh, they might be rotating at the same rate. But nonetheless, one is rotating, you know, if I look down on it, one looks like it's rotating clockwise, one looks like it's rotating counterclockwise. So, yes. We do say omega is a vector. The direction of rotation is encapsulated in writing omega as a vector. If Right, a positive omega means a different, uh, it's rotating in a different direction than say the same value but a negative value for, for omega. Then it's rotating in the opposite direction. Um, so, how do we actually write down omega as a vector? And you might be able to appreciate why this is a bit of a challenge. You know, suppose, you know, I have my pen here and I have an object that is rotating around the pen in this direction. In that case, the actual velocity, you know, before we specify, we use the vector to specify the velocity, the direction of the velocity at every moment. But in this case, if you're rotating around an axis, the, you know, it would not be the same direction as your, you know, omega is not in the same direction as your velocity, because, because in that case, it's always changing. Your velocity vector is always rotating, you know, to be, you know, perpendicular in a sense to, you know, this axis of rotation. So we need something else in order to specify what is going on um, as you rotate around it. In, in axis of rotation around some point of origin. So the direction of omega is given by what is called the right hand rule. Omega does not point Omega does not point um, 
along the direction of motion. Rather, omega points along the axis of rotation. So if an object is moving around this axis, then that means omega, you know, it's doing this or it's doing this. Omega either points straight up along the axis of rotation, which also is up, or omega either points straight down, anti-parallel to the axis of rotation. So which is which? The actual motion of the object is parallel to your fingers on your right hand. If your thumb points along omega. So is that you use your hand and you use your thumb to specify the direction that omega is pointing. So in this case, I would say omega is pointing straight up. In this case, I would say omega is pointing in this direction. You know, in this case, omega is pointing straight down. The direction of your right hand thumb, not your left. <laughs> we'll see why in a second. So for your right hand, you take, you essentially, you essentially, you give a, the way I think of it is I give a thumbs up, but I don't, um, I don't clench my hand. Uh, I keep it kind of open, like a, like in a C or a cup. And then I point omega along the axis of rotation, which suppose it's straight up in this case. So I point, so my thumb is pointing in the same direction as my, as the axis of rotation. In which case my fingers of my right hand are pointing in the same in the direction that the object is actually rotating. So if the object is rotating this way, then I have my fingers also follow that direction. So in this case, my right hand, you know, when I do it like this, my fingers are pointing, you know, as I rotate my hand around, my, my fingers point along the direction that the object is actually moving. Notice I can't do that. If the object is moving like this, I can't do that if I point my thumb downward because then my fingers point in the opposite direction. You know, the object is trying to go this way, then my fingers are pointing in the opposite direction. So in this case, right, if the object is rotating, what would be counterclockwise, if you're looking straight down, then I would point my thumb along the axis of rotation in order for my fingers to curl counterclockwise. My thumb has to be pointing straight up not down. Let's do a few examples of that with the right hand rule. Um, let's see. Suppose you have a tabletop. This you can imagine because you could try to look straight down on a tabletop and imagine this. You look, you look straight down on top of a table and you see a ball on a string. Maybe I have a ball on a string that I'm spinning in the center and the ball is moving counterclockwise. Over and over and over again, counterclockwise. Counterclockwise on table. What direction does the angular velocity point in? There's clearly velocity, but that velocity is continuously changing direction. Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's left, sometimes it's down, sometimes it's right. But it's always going in the same circle. It's always going counterclockwise. 
So in that case, we should be able to say that there is a constant velocity, angular velocity vector omega that specifies that yes, it's going counterclockwise. So in this case, I would think that the axis of rotation, everything is rotating about the center of the table. So I might call this my axis of rotation. And so I know omega is either going to point up away from the table or down into the table. In this case, what I want, I want, let's suppose my, let's suppose uh, I think that it points up and away from the table. Then I should be able to point my thumb away from the table and my finger should curl in the same counterclockwise direction, in which case it does. So in this case, we would say omega points up and away from table. As opposed to someone else who does the same thing, but they set it up so that the ball is moving clockwise, not counterclockwise. In this case, I could take my axis of rotation. I'm, you know, I'm looking straight down and I'm seeing it move clockwise. So then if I put my thumb either, either parallel, you know, along the axis of rotation, so it either points straight up or straight down. But if I point it straight up, then my fingers want to curl, um, I guess you have to do it this way, my fingers then want to curl counterclockwise. Um, but if I point my thumb down into the table, then my fingers point, you know, my fingers curl in the clockwise direction, which is the same direction that the object is moving in. So in this case, I would say omega points into the table or down the axis of rotation towards the ground. In the case of what I gave up here, I gave an example earlier where maybe there was some rotation that looks like this. And it's all rotating about some central axis. You know, it's at some weird angle there. Which looks like it's going in this direction. Oops, I erased too much. Just trying to get some 3D perspective here. So therefore, I, there are two possibilities. Either omega points this way, or omega points this way. Which is which? You try. So in this case, I might try to point it. Um, I'm not very good at drawing hands. Uh, but I might try to point, uh, I should have practiced this before. All right, that's a god awful hand. But I might try to point my thumb, uh, you know, in this direction, perhaps first. So I'm claiming if I did that, I'm claiming that omega is in this direction. But in that case, my fingers my fingers are curling behind and then in front and moving in this direction like this. Which is opposite what was drawn, uh, what we're trying to analyze. So that's not right. So in this case, we would say that omega points in this direction. That is how you would quantify the direction that the, of the rotation around the axis. All right, here's one to try. So this is, you know, let's say it's a baton with a ball at the end, or a rod with a ball at the end, and it appears to be rotating clockwise in the xy plane. What direction does omega point? 
In this case, I would say that omega points into the page. So in the case of clockwise motion, you know, I want, you know, the axis of rotation in this case is, you know, I guess it's right here, but it kind of goes into the page and then out of the page. And so I either have to point my thumb directly into the page or directly out of the screen or out of the page. And the only way to get my fingers to curl in the clockwise direction, my right, my right hand figure, fingers, is if I have my thumb pointing into the page. So here we might say omega points into the page, which is sometimes written as a circle with an X. into page. Here's an example where we could also look at this and see why the left hand doesn't work. So we know now if we've convinced ourselves that omega needs to point into the page, because that's the direction my right hand fingers curl in. Notice if you do it with your left hand by accident and point your thumb into the page, your left hand fingers curl in the opposite direction. You get the opposite answer. So I always say for fellow left-handers, um, this is our moment. Because um, there will inevitably always be at least one person on the exam who is right-handed, writing out their answers using their right hand, because that's their dominant hand, and then trying to do the right-hand rule, but using their left hand instead. Right-handers, sorry, you have to put down your pencil, do it with your right hand, and then pick up your pencil and do it again, and then write down your answer. For us left-handers, we can continue writing, but we can also keep our, our right hand at the ready. I will not apologize for that. Left-handed people have it hard enough as it is. None of the desks help, you know, are, are situated properly for us. All right, then what about this case? case is the same as what it was before but in the opposite direction so in this case omega must point out of the screen or out of the of, of the paper um, in order for your fingers to curl in the same counterclockwise direction what about this I've covered up some stuff so in this case it is rotating around the positive x-axis you know, so it might be something that looks like this. Which direction is, should Omega be pointing uh, to capture that motion? The first step I would say is to identify what is the axis of rotation, because then you know Omega is either, you know, is somewhere along the axis of rotation. What is the region where the object is rotating around. So in that case here, um, the axis of rotation in this case, the axis of rotation is the x-axis. It is rotating around the positive x-axis, so omega either points directly to the right on the, on the screen as I've drawn this, or directly to the left. So in this case, the only way for it to go in the back behind and then in, you know, towards you know, in the front as I've drawn it is if omega is pointing to the left in this case. So I would say omega must be pointing in this direction in order to get the motion that we're seeing. Now this. It goes behind. So in this case, the rotational axis is the y-axis. Uh, it's rotating around the y-axis in this case. So omega either points straight down or straight up as I've drawn it. 
and for it to go behind the y-axis and then loop around to the front as it's been drawn, uh, it looks like to me that omega has to point downward in this case. Because then if I put my thumb pointing downward, my right, ha my right hand fi fingers curl in the same direction that that object is rotating in. All right, last one. So in this case, it is not rotating about any of the cardinal axes, x or y, but it's rotating about this dashed line. So the rotation axis is either pointing kind of diagonally up to the right or diagonally down to the lower left. And I claim in order to get the motion that's being observed, omega must be pointing in this direction. That is the right hand rule. We will see it again. Uh, with torque. But when we specify omega as a vector, when I write down that omega equals, you know, pi over 2 radians, you know, since it's a vector, really I should be stating it's a vector about some rotation axis. So I might say, right, about the, you know, z axis would be, would be a case where um, or instead of about the z-axis, I might say, you know, out of the page. So in that case, omega is pointing kind of up towards us, which this is sometimes used to say, out of the page. You know, circle with the dot is out of the screen, out of the, out of the paper, a circle with an X is into the screen, into the paper. In which case, then my thumb is pointing out of the screen. Uh, the rotation, you know, that suggests then my, if my thumb is this, the right hand rule says that omega is causing objects to rotate uh, counterclockwise. But omega itself points out of the page. What time are we at? Five more minutes. So let me then just write down, um, with that, we can continue, or again, remember we said X was analog, you know, the analogy was theta. Omega, the analogy is, uh, whoops, for velocity, the analogy is omega. Your book, I think, goes into a little bit of discussion on how theta itself is not quite a vector. Um, it's a subtlety, so I'm not too concerned about it. What is the analogy for acceleration? Uh, there is in def indeed an analogy which we could call angular acceleration. So we could define the, similarly, the average angular acceleration Right. alpha average as, again, just like what we did uh, before. Before it was you know, delta V over delta T. Now we define as delta omega over delta T, which then gets us to the angular acceleration or the instantaneous angular acceleration which then is just the derivative. All right, again, take delta t, refine it super, super small. You're asking what is going on with the uh, angular change in angular velocity, or the change in the angular velocity uh, at a given instantaneous moment. And again, the analogy and it's a little bit trickier now because of this right hand rule stuff. Um, but let's see, 
I was using green in the past. I don't know why I've switched to blue. Remember before we had something like this where we said if this is V and this is A, we would call this an example of speeding up. The analogy, um, or the analogous statement rather, is if you had rotation that is like this, something was rotating around, that is defined by some omega that points, in this case, to the upper left. Convince yourself of that by the right hand rule. If then the alpha was also pointing in the same direction, this would be an example of rotation is speeding up. Just how, velo just how acceleration tells you how the velocity vector is changing. Alpha is telling you how omega is changing. Alpha pointing in the same direction as omega says that omega is going to get a magnitude that's bigger and bigger and bigger, which is going to correspond to faster and faster rotational rates. Similarly, when we said this is an example of slowing down, maybe even eventually turning around if we, if we wait long enough. Uh, let me go in the opposite direction just to practice. In this case, by the right hand rule, I would say that omega points this direction. But if then I said that, uh, that alpha, it's not quite anti-parallel, but then if I said that alpha points in this direction and the opposite direction is omega, I would say this would be a case of rotation slowing down. And again, if omega was brought to zero and there was still an angular acceleration, omega then might start to point in the other direction. So that might be the case where the rotation slows down and then eventually turns around and starts rotating in the other direction. Just like how what we saw with velocity where an object slowed down and then turned around and went back in the opposite direction. Completely analogous, completely same idea, just now we're dealing with rotation instead of uh, translational motion. And the last thing I'll write down is that the kinematic equations for constant alpha are the same as what we saw before. Notice in how we define all these quantities, we defined them in essentially the exact same way as we did position, velocity, acceleration, you know, angular position, angular velocity, angular acceleration. There was nothing different about the way we defined the two except for the symbols we used uh, in this little right-hand rule thing. So the good news here is that, you know, for the linear cases where a was a constant, we could contrast that with the angular versions where alpha is a constant. For the linear cases, we said what? We said the displacement was x2 minus x1. For angular, we can say, okay, then the, the angular displacement is alpha 2 minus, or theta 2 minus theta 1. V was dx dt. Actually, let me stick. Let me just stick with one d. Omega then is d theta dt. A is dv dt. Alpha is d omega dt. But then we also get the kinematics equations in exactly the same way. Before we said V equaled V naught plus A T. Here we get omega equals omega naught plus alpha T. Before we said X equals uh, 
x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared. Here we can say theta equals theta naught plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. Exact same equations, different symbols. They correspond to different things. One is linear motion, one is rotational motion. Uh, but anything we learn from problem solving with these, with these equations from chapter three, I guess it was, or chapter two, same sorts of things uh, with the angular uh, versions. So in class, we'll make sure we understand kind of what these quantities represent, and then we will do, redo some 1D motions, uh, both rotation instead.